Hello, hello, hi. Oh. Hi. hi. Hi, how are you? Good, how are Doma, you? Doma, how are you? Welcome to Utah Virtually. <laughs> Thank nice you so to be much. there. Yeah, it's good, good to be there. Never quite said that before, but it's good to be there, even though we're here. <laughs> yeah. So as you know, we're coming to you from Salt Lake City. We showed your film here as a part of our programming for Black History Month. Just want to thank the both of you for being here and for sharing this incredible story uh, for everyone to see. We do have some questions for you tonight, and we will open it up for audience questions um, after that. Um, and so just so everyone knows, again, we have John Alexander, who's the director of the film, and Sharon Preston Fulta, Louis Armstrong's daughter, is here tonight. So thank you so much. So I, I do have a question. I guess we could start with you, Sharon. Um, you know, in the film, you said you waited your whole life to tell the world that you were Louis Armstrong's daughter, his only child. And you, you spoke about like kind of the moment where you wanted to talk about this uh, to the world. And I, I know that you wrote a book first, I believe, is that in 2012? Yes. yes. Um, and then this film came out. Can you tell us a little bit about like, what, what was the process of writing your story and, and getting this out into the world? Well, you know, for all my life, it was the family secret. And people in my family knew, and I would say some close friends would know because I would whisper and it would be that big secret. But as I got older and really um, once I turned 50 and I was a grandmother, I started thinking about my legacy and what I was leaving for them. And I just really got tired of it being the secret, but I still just didn't know how to tell my story. But I was encouraged to um, see his will and once I saw the will and saw where I had been completely erased, it let me know that I had to make myself visible. So that started the process of, well, where do I go from here? And I was very fortunate. People directed me. Um, I found a great entertainment lawyer and uh, they led me to a literary agent, a co-author who helped me write the book. Deneen Milner and self-published uh, Amazon had the letters from my father, put them up for auction, which created publicity. And then articles in the uh, New Orleans Times, Picayune, the New York Times, uh, in uh, the London Telegraph and the uh, Sydney Australian Herald and other places and just really getting the word out there and going and, and having uh, different book events through the years. Um, I've always worked. I've always had a full-time job. And then for the past 40 years, I've been an account executive at various radio stations. And in the Tampa market where I live now, I um, work for the NPR station, WUSF. And one of my clients was uh, producing a festival in St. Petersburg, Florida. And that's Leah Umberger. She and I met. She I gave her a copy of the book. She gave me a call two years later after I gave her a copy of the book and said that she would like to um, create a documentary and that she had a director in mind. And that's how I met John and JC. So, uh, John, you want to no, talk I'm, about your... I'm that all that all yeah meshes with what I have to say I'm just so glad that that you know series of events happens like <clears throat> because Sharon and my you know coming together as really as as friends and family I feel like we are at this point but you know yeah. as as colleagues like to work on this really um I realize this is more than the, the question asked but it's like such intimate and emotional material like you know it was really important I felt that Sharon was comfortable with uh, the director and that I was com comfortable, you know, with the main subject. It's something that's so, I mean, it's so close to the heart. You know, this is not like something for the encyclopedia. I mean, it is a historical record, but it's really something that's, that comes from a place of emotion rather than history or fact. So that was like, I just remember sharing, like when, when, when we first connected after I read your book, it was like, okay, we have a, we understand, we understand each other. We can communicate to each other, you know, in a way, um, 
that's honest and you know doesn't have to to leave out any any of the kind of difficult um parts of these conversations because this is really difficult material you know and personal material to share in um so that's the only thing i would add there is that just like once we met it was like it was a deep connection and and you know it was that type of connection that that fueled i i would say that um you know our work and um, and and john understood it was very important for me that my voice come through you know and i didn't want to work with anyone that would take my book and want to sensationalize it, make it more about my father, you know, embellish. It was about my voice and the universal um, truth that everyone wants to be seen and that you just need to accept your truth, whatever that is, and coming to terms with it. And, and, and John understood that. Thank you for that. And and I want to just say before I even ask a question, one, John and Sharon, thank you so much for sharing this story. It was really amazing and 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 the vulnerability to really tell a story like this. So Sharon, I have a I have a follow-up question for you. So so you said, you know, like telling a story like that, it's especially I would say a, a figure like who your father was, you know, and, and many probably feel like they have a piece to him because of the legacy that is Louis Armstrong. So how has been the reception of something like that, especially when you think about so many years of people feeling that he had no child and then all of a sudden, I, I don't wanna say you come out of nowhere because clearly you have always been a part of the story, but just not told. And so how has the fanfare and the reception been? Well, you know, mainly positive. I can say that, it, you know, when it first came out, um, people were surprised. And if there was any pushback, it was from, I would say, that the jazz community, but not all, just certain ones that felt that they really knew the story and that they had all the, the facts and the details. And almost like, how dare I come out? <laughs> And, and, you know, dispute what they thought they knew. So uh, but from the public, you know, people really saw the um, the relationship piece, the family piece, the broken family piece and coming to terms with that. So, you know, uh, it, very positive reviews. The, the, the book had positive reviews. The movie had tremendous positive reviews. So. You know, I, and every once in a while, I still get someone in that community trying to challenge me. And I'm just like, you know what? I, I've just told my truth. I, it, you can accept it or not accept it. And, and Rashawn, your question about, I mean, it's really true that I feel like it just as background that like the world and not even just America, I mean, really internationally, people claim Louis Armstrong as if, as if as if he was their father. I mean it's like people we feel everybody feels like he's they're related to him because of his public persona and that kind of jovial spirit and obviously his music which touched so many people and like the and still does and the last thing you know we ever wanted to do would be to like tear down that legacy or or we we're, we're trying to add to it add complexity to the picture that's something i felt like with this material was it is delicate because people do claim Louis Armstrong. You don't want to, like Sharon said, like take away their kind of relationship with, you know, which they claim with him, even though she's uh, his daughter. Um, but, you know, his, his public perception has really been sort of reduced to like, okay, he plays the trumpet. He sings these happy go lucky songs. Like, what else do people really know about him? They might know his music history, but the personal history, it's its pretty hard to find a lot of those those details. I mean, we did research for this film trying to, you know, reading his My Life in New Orleans and his different publications, but it's all kind of through a child's perspective and somewhat uh, nebulous and doesn't, and, and a lot of the facts around his birth date, for example, or have been kind of, you know, gone through a little switcheroo. So there's like, there's sort of a, a whole lore around him anyway. Um, so it, it was a, in a way it was a very difficult position to approach, you know, because I, I felt I didn't want to step on anyone's toes. The public claims him so clearly, but I, f I 
found, Sharon, I'm sure you agree, like internationally, basically what the, the overwhelming reaction is, oh, wow, like I never, you know, I never knew about this. It, it, it makes him, it humanizes him. It takes him away from being this, this kind of icon and actually, you know, reveals more of his like three dimensionality. Uh, he's a real human being. So it's a story about Sharon and all from all actually from Sharon's perspective and all through Sharon's words. I mean, strictly so, but it reveals, hopefully it reveals in a very gently, gentle, non uh, bitter type way, you know, uh, a more well-rounded um, truth ar around that relationship. Yeah, thank you for that. I think, you know, one of the things that really moved us about this, this film was the complexity of it. I, I do agree that very often we hold up these figures that we don't really know anything about. And then we're shocked to find out that they're not this image that we <laughs> purported them to be. And then we get, you know, very disappointed. Um, I would like to know, just Sharon, like for you, since, you know, when it was revealed to you that the Lucille that your father was talking about wasn't your mother, and then you you found about you found out about his passing. What was life like with your mother, like up until you know you you spoke out about this? Well, you know, in the earlier days, um, especially at, at first when I found out about the other Lucille, as a child, I couldn't articulate it, but a trust had been broken. So, you, you know, I grew up rather quickly and became pretty self, um, you know, independent or self-dependent. And, um, I, I, you know, shortly after, that's when I kind of just would do things on my own. And, and, and you know, so my mother and I, our relationship wasn't as close, but thankfully, I liked school. I liked the activities that I did, and that kept me, you know, somewhat centered. Uh, you know, moving forward, once my father passed, though, for my mother, I, I think she went into a depression for a, a long time, and I really couldn't identify what was going on. But I just kept doing what I was, you know, going to school and and just in the household, we were always kind of separated. We had our space and 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 unto ourselves. So it was just more of that. And then I became a young mother. And that was a whole nother dynamic. Um, you know, at that point, my mother really got involved. And, and instead of really assisting me, she kind of took over raising my son. So that created a whole nother set of problems. <laughs> You know, but through it all, um, e with all of that, you know, m only my mother and I shared the experiences and, and no one else could relate. And that kept us uh, connected. And I became my mother's caretaker, uh, I would say, the last 10 years of her life. And, um, you know, um really supported her in every way and physically took care of her. And I, you know, and all the way through, I understood. And even though she never really wanted this story told and she finally relented, I, you know, I, I would say she was still a little sad about it, but she finally did understood, you know, she understood and she was in her nineties at that point. So it took a long time. Wow. So, so looking at the finished product, it, you know, and I, I can't even imagine how much footage you all had, especially when you look at the timelines, is there anything that was left out that you wish, you know, you wish it could have been included in there, but it just, you know, there's an hour long you know, documentary. So it just could not for the sake of time be included. Well, you'll find this uh, amusing, but you know, the part where we're waiting for my father to come. Uh, back in the day, you know, your hair was always pressed with the hot comb. Oh, oh, oh yeah. My, I know, don't know they, what my sister's. <laughs> when they talk about the Dax, I, I, I wanted some image of a little kid having their hair fried, you know, with the steam coming off and everything, because that was my 
reality. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, and, and so for me, I would have liked to have seen um, some of that, but <laughs> I think I think at full disclosure, we did test this out. This this idea, I was trying to make it work as best as we could, <laughs> but uh, yeah, it was just it never quite it never we, quite. We happened. couldn't get it. To, we tried to find the vintage Dax can, yeah. and you know, and uh, you know the hot comb on the stove. Who mm -hmm. everybody has electric stoves these days. We don't have the gas stove like we used to. Seeing the fire, uh, but that sizzle um, when it touches your skin. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the, the and the, the steam, you know, all of that. Um, but I I think everything really, you know, that was in the book that you know made sense to go in the movie uh was there. John, was there anything that um you saw? I mean, always. I mean, there's there's so there's so much more, you know. I feel like these conversations are nice because it gives us like a, a little chance to talk a little bit more about the, the material than than what's actually detailed in the film. I feel like this this editorially really for me was <clears throat> like it was kind of an exercise of restraint. I mean, I had to be so disciplined to not add anything really. I really just wanted Sharon's memoir, an edit of Sharon's memoir read in her words, a hundred percent um, you know, untampered with. So I really didn't, I didn't, you know, add any verbiage in there. Um, in terms of things I, you know, wish the film covered or things like that, it's, again, it's strictly focused on this father-daughter relationship. And I felt there was kind of a power of, of less is more with, the, with our storytelling here. So I really tried to focus myself and my own imagination on that little girl, like the, the same Dax Grace little girl. I mean, looking out the, the window, waiting for her father, waiting for the phone to ring, put wearing her little outfit and everything. Like to me, that has so much pathos. I wanted to just stick in that world because that was really the world you know, the scope of the story that we're talking about. I mean, the film does not go into Sharon's life. I mean, it barely touches on, you know, Sharon's career and which is, you know, a whole other story and an interesting thing. Um, so I, I want to include more, but I know in my heart of hearts that the film, it's little Satchmo. It's supposed to be kind of, you know, the contained, the, the young version of this and, and, uh, so it was a struggle. I'm, I'm, as you can see, I'm flip flopping here. I, I always want to add more, but uh, the the nature of this beast was to to keep it really simple and to keep it really lean um, on that on that child's perspective. Really, the father daughter relationship through the through the eyes of a child. Yeah, yeah. I think it was really great to see such a relatable story with a public figure on screen. Um, I don't know how often we get to hear from. The children of these very famous people and like what it was like for them and so i yeah thank you both for like putting this story out there and making it available for all of us to see it was um, my pleasure and honor this has been such a such a wonderful collaboration and yeah honor to have been a part of it at all but again i, I don't want to tamper with anything it's just sharing <laughs> that's been my whole that was the whole approach yeah. <laughs> so yeah. And I'm very thankful. I couldn't have had a better team. We were small and mighty, but yeah. wow, you know, uh, we're looking back now at all that we've accomplished and it's just uh, uh, amazing. And and the reception and the feedback and and the opportunities to have it screened, it's just uh, so so much more than than we imagined and but so thankful. Yeah. At this time, we would like to open it up for the audience to ask you a couple questions, if that's okay. Sure. Does anyone have any questions at this time? We'll bring the, the mic to you. We have one right here. Uh, do you get any royalties from his music? If he, his wife, Lucille, passed and had no children, do you get any royalties now? No, actually, once uh, everything went to Lucille and then Lucille... Um, turned everything over to uh, the foundation, to a and created a foundation. So the uh, foundation is supported by uh, his. You know, is that's a part of the foundation. 
Hello. Um, first, I want to say I went to USF St. Pete and I love WUSF. So I'm so thrilled. I don't know. That's so cool. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. OK, so my question and I, I hope I'm not, I don't know, overstepping, but I think there's kind of like this interesting line that you're walking, having, you know, being the child of a very iconic person and then now being open about it. Um and I guess I'm wondering, like, do you, I felt like the material didn't really critically engage with his treatment of your mother or how he kind of like used his money to sort of control you guys. And I, I don't know, I guess I'm curious about how you engage with that topic. And if you're doing, if you don't engage with it for a reason, uh, and if the reason result revolves around like preserving his legacy. I don't know. That was a very long-winded, long-winded question. No, no, no. I hear you. Um, the main reason I don't engage with that is um, I, I be, because it deals really with my mother and the fact that I've told my story, you know, she, she wanted to be private. And so I feel that, you know, I've, I've said e enough about our relationship and then looking at the money and 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 I hear everything you're saying but the, and that's definitely something between uh the two of them how they worked out their relationship but for me I have to look at the money as um really a a, a gift because legally she, she never made him um sign anything that would have me supported so the money came, supported me fully. I, I was able to uh, attend private school. You know, all, all of my material needs were taken care of. And I look at that and say, oh, my God, it could have been so much worse in, in that way. Do I have um, regrets about the fact that she didn't have it? Um, you know, done legally so that we would have been taken care of, you know, in, you know, um, way after. I, I Absolutely, I do. But thankfully, I was able to, you know, create um, a path for myself. And so I know that that path came to me based on the foundation that I had uh, mainly with my education. So, you know, I, I hope that answers your question. Sharon, I, I want to I, I want to follow up with with that. So it, it, what's interesting to me is thinking about 19, the 60s and you and your mom living in Mount Vernon as a single mother in a huge house. I mean, this is a big, you know, what we would consider today a McMansion. Mm -hmm. And so how is this secret kept when, you know, people in the neighborhood have to have speculations or wonder how are these two individuals affording to live in this big house with a two car garage with no one driving and things like that? Well, my mother was married before. Um, so she was always and kept her married name, Mrs. Preston. Mm -hmm. So when people would ask, she she is a widow. And then the assumption was always that my father passed. And that was, you know, when people asked, that's what I said. So because she was a widow that, you know, a lot of the questions kind of um, they, they weren't asked. And also, you know, Mount Vernon in at that time, there were a lot of uh, show business people that had moved into the area. So, you know, it was a community. My mother was show business. Uh, she knew other people. And, and so she, you know, she knew some people. It wasn't, full, you know, it was a lot of urbanites moving in. So that urbanite sensibility kind of was there as well. I'd heard you mentioned that you, you had felt like you had been deleted or that you had been erased and that also at different points, you know, you were looking for validation, but never really felt you got it. And throughout this movie, um, you know, it had also mentioned that because 
everyone had this sort of Paris social relationship with Louis Armstrong that you didn't really want to taint that. So um, what is it that you really want to say? You had a chance to get this message out and you did write a letter that you had read in the end, but like, what is it that you want to say since you had felt you had been deleted all this time? Well, I, I, I think, you know, what I wanted to say is that I, I did exist. Uh, I do exist. And we were a family. And mainly that we were very important to him because even when people acknowledge that we that I existed, it it's like I'm I was one of the crowd. And what was very important was for people to know just how much he loved me and my mother. So um having those parts of the letters that he wrote to us be in the film and and reading that in his own words, seeing how much he really did care for us. That's what's important. I, I really want people to know, no, he 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 loved us. We weren't a, a perfect family, but he he loved us. Um a lot of mistakes were made, but that love never left. All right, we have one more. Um I just want to I'll ask one of the questions. When you mentioned um, in the film that you felt that you were doing the same thing to your, your child, the one that you had, uh, leaving your child alone, being raised by someone else and you not being involved. Did that, as uh, that your child grew up, did you change that to try to maybe not repeat what your uh, your dad did to you? Is, would you uh, be willing to explain what you did and the process you went through so that your child would feel like you were a part of that child's life? Um, I I was in, involved with him um, as much as I could be. And I, I would say that when he became a father, I was extremely involved with his children and, you know, um, trying to be an example of what I'd learned of of family and what what the parent in my mind should do for the child. So as he was when he was younger, I wanted to be that support and support him in his vision and goals. And then with his children, uh, do the same thing. I I was very involved. I was almost like a another parent. One thing I didn't do was try to um, out you know, the, the take take his place. So if there was something that he and the, the children's mother, if they had laid down a, a rule or a law, I didn't want to come in there and change it. And, and, and that was something that I saw as I was raising him. So I learned that, you know, they're the parents and I was the support and, and that's what I did. So that, and that's what I did differently. Sharon, thanks for telling your story. It's really cool the way you did it. And John, your enthusiasm is awesome. Um, looking forward, Sharon, what would be your bucket list for the future? Well, uh, John and I were just talking about, um, you know, the possibility of a podcast. And, you know, I'm just trying to explore the the, the point of view, you know, of telling my story, but in in, uh, in a wider range, telling more stories like mine, maybe. So, I I think that's that's what's next. Um, a, a feature film, a musical, you know, who knows that that could be. But that I don't know. That that's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. I don't know so, if you want to see me sing, sing, act, and dance that much, uh, Sharon. You know, if we do that. To, <laughs> do that <laughs> So, so Sharon, I, I have a question. I, so I'm blessed with two, two boys, two rambunctious boys, and I know what they're like when they're on a bus. So I'm just trying to figure out like how you little Sachimo on a tour bus with, with the Louis Armstrong, how are you hiding? Like, this is my dad and things like that, where I would just expect, you know, thinking about how a, a young child, maybe five to you know seven years old is not, climbing all over him and almost giving it away. 
Oh no! Well, everybody on the bus knew. I mean, it was oh, okay. his. It it was his band. Oh, they knew. And my mother traveling, so it was a, a, a interesting arrangement because we traveled with him. His wife, when we were with him, she was not, and it was just understood. And the band knew us, and I knew all the the band members. And my favorite part of being on the bus was actually, you know, just seeing all the sights. And, um, you know, my mother kept me busy and, you know, and made sure I was, you know, uh, quiet and just, you know, so I, I was pretty good on the bus. I I just didn't enjoy the ride, but they all knew and they were all really nice to me. All, all the band members. Um, great memories there. We have another question. I wanted to know. First of all, it was nice seeing you and thank you for your contribution to us to be able to witness your life. I wanted to know, did you inherit any of his musical traits like playing the trumpet or singing yourself? I did. And as a young child, I I, I sang in a choir at school. I did learn to pay, play the trumpet and uh, growing up in Mount Vernon in the summertime, all of the uh, music departments would come together and it was the summer music and arts program. We called it summer band school. And we would go, you could sign up and learn how to play instruments. And it was just something that I did. So I learned percussion. Uh, I played the accordion and played in the, in uh, the accordion band. Um, so as, as a youngster, I did play and sing, but I, channel my music talents now uh, by volunteering at our community radio station. And I put together uh, a music show once a week. And um, so that's that to me, you know, the ear that I got from playing and listening to my father and all the music growing up, I, I now put that into a hour and a half show on Saturdays. You spoke about, you know, your legacy, Sharon. And so I'm wondering, what was it and when did you tell your son that he was the grandson of Louis Armstrong and then subsequently your grandchildren? Like, what, what has that been like to tell them where where they come from, basically? Um, my son knew early on, I would say, you know, uh, when he was like 10. So he knew. And uh, my grandchildren around the around the same age. And for them, you know, um, they weren't, you know, it's kind of uh, distant from them because of the life, the life was not related. So it was really hard for them to relate to it. It got easier once I, once I told the story and they had more of an understanding, but they grew up, you know, with my mother and it was just something that she didn't want to talk a lot about. So, but they, they understood. And, but, um, I wouldn't say that there was a great excitement because they they were kind of removed from it. But now it's just something that they know and it's a part of them. Um, thanks for this film. I thought it was so beautiful. And I had a question. Um, it's It's so personal and it's so your story. And I think that in itself is like just is so um, beautiful and compassionate and important. And I also wonder if there are um, like other themes that you hope audiences resonate with or other issues or topics that this will stir up for folks. Yeah, absolutely. You know, um, finding your voice, secrets can be damaging, you know, never really went into how, you know, we'd we'd say it was the secret, but we never really go into, you know, um, just how damaging secrets can be, you know, for families. But, you know, I, I want people to, you know, I hope, hopefully that they heard that. Um, but mainly, you know, whatever, owning owning yourself, owning your story. So whatever that is, own it and speak up about it. Because if you don't live in your truth, then you, you won't have peace. And it took me, it took me a while to get to that place. And, um, you know, I, I can say that I, I did a lot of work in, you know, self, self, 
self-improvement, self-analysis, analysis, um, just getting out and, and you know, empowerment, um, deeply rooted in faith, all of that to come to a place to be able to tell the story and look at it from all sides and take blame out mm-hmm. and just be with what was and and then come to a place to understand how flawed we all are, but, you know, recognize the good and recognize the love. I love that. So you have your memoir. Now you have this amazing documentary. Do you feel like, and I know you and John kind of talked about potentially a podcast out there at some point in time, but do you feel like this has given you the closure that you've needed with, with this, the connection and the legacy uh, and the secret with uh, that you've carried all these years? Yes, yes, absolutely. Because it, it, along with that, the the bonus that has happened is when I'm out and I'm speaking with people, they tell me, people will come up and share stories about my father and how he touched their lives. And that's something that I didn't have growing up because I couldn't talk about the connection. And so people want me to know how much he meant to them and they want to share that with me. And I'm really honored by that, you know, that they want to share that with me because I'm a part of him and they want me to know that. So um, I, I I always get that. And, and that really um, continues to help with with the closure and and the connection. And John, do you have any other films coming up? What else are you working on? <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm in post production on another documentary, and I'm in pre production on a suspense horror thriller. <laughs> so very oh, okay. very all over the place. Uh, yeah, but um, but uh, my previous film is also out there on Amazon. It's a, a film called This Is Love. Um, and um another another passion project near and dear to my heart um did it it's about a, a soul singer a late soul singer named rudy love who whose voice you have heard whether you know it or not and it's one of those uh characters who's that that's a that's a project i'm also really passionate about so if you want to check out some other work you can you can check out this is love and that's streaming on amazon Well, I think that's all the questions we have for you tonight. Just want to thank you both again for joining us. It's been such a pleasure to meet you, even if it was virtually, um, and get to hear your story um, tonight and, and hear more about it um, through our conversation. Yeah. And if people who are listening are here or when we go and air this, if they want to follow you on your socials, John and and Sharon, do you have or if they want to listen to your your jazz program that you curate down in Florida, Sharon, did, is there a place where people can find you? Sure. Uh, WSLR dot org. You can listen live Saturday mornings from 930 to 11. Or you can go in the archives. We keep two weeks worth of programming there. Uh, John, our socials for yeah, those then- Nachmo. Yeah, you can follow everything, you know, Little Satchmo related at Little Satchmo Doc is the handle. That's Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. And, uh, you know, we don't try We don't spam people too much, but we put a lot of interesting content out there. So, uh, yeah, definitely follow along the journey because a um, lot of a lot of cool things going on. You know, this film is was made for PBS. It's um, out there, you know, on on television in different different places and in theaters internationally and at film festivals and at, you know, great um kind of arts events like like this and film series. So a lot of a lot of things to keep up with. But yeah, at Little Satchmo Doc. And and our website, uh little satchmodoc.com. Yep. Little satchmodoc.com. You can read all about the nitty-gritty behind the scenes stuff. We have a lot of press links there. Um Read about the team. Read about the project. Nice. Thank you. And Sharon, I'd be remiss if I didn't tell you that your father's song, "It's a Wonderful World." That's uh, that's what my wife walked down the aisle with her dad. Yeah. Wow. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you for having us.
Absolutely. Thank you both again for joining us tonight. Again, this is Sharon Preston Folta and John Alexander. Um, our program is Black, Bold, and Brilliant here in Salt Lake City under the Utah Film Center. You can also follow us on social media, Black, Bold, Brilliant, SLC. We're on Facebook, and you can find us on the Utah Film Center website. Thank you all, and have a great evening. Thank you, everyone, showing up. Get home safely. <laughs>